Thank you for that, Carlos. And um, our final and uh, fourth speaker on this panel is Andrew Norton, who's uh, at the International Institute of Environment and Development in London. Andrew's talking about social policy and research priorities to promote <coughs> nature-based solutions to climate change. Andrew. Thank you very much, Bhaskar. Many thanks to the organizers as well. It's um, been fantastic to be here. Um, the framing I'm going to talk about, uh, social policy and nature-based solutions to climate change, may not be hugely familiar to many of you, but I hope to persuade you that it has real potential in terms of contributing to some of the goals we've been discussing over the last couple of days. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk about the potential of social protection schemes at scale, uh, so it's one dimension of social policy, um, to unlock labour, finance and possibly also cultural change on a significant scale. Um, social protection in particular, in certain uh, ways and through certain mechanisms, um, is already promoting vast amounts of local environmental labour on local environmental public goods. Um, if you're not familiar, there's been a tremendous kind of growth in social protection globally. Um, the figures suggest that direct and indirect beneficiaries of social protection schemes globally increased by a factor of nine between 2000 and 2015. Um, most of this innovation has been driven by developing countries and particularly uh, some of the larger middle income countries. Um, in South Asia, for example, uh, numbers reached by social protection increased from about 30 million in 2000 to um, 400 million in 2015. So vast amounts of public finance are being mobilised for social protection and this is unlikely to be a passing fad. Um, I think things like the fear of automation, the discourse about concerns about the future of work, even concerns with political change mean that this is likely to be a durable um, priority. So I'm going to talk about one social protection scheme mostly, um, which we've had a team working on from IIED, but it is the largest single social protection scheme in the world, um, the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, which reaches 50 million households in India and has an annual budget of close to $6 billion. Um, the features of it, it's got a rights-based structure where people have the right to 100 days of paid labour a year, targeted obviously towards the poorest, um, and one third of those are supposed to be women. It's run by local institutions, by panchayats, who work to identify the activities that take place, and it funds largely people to work on local scale public goods. Um, and the majority of these, over half, 53%, can be categorised as local environmental public goods, particularly around soil and water conservation, a lot of watershed work, a lot of afforestation. <laughs> Um, there are other similar schemes in the world. This isn't the only one. Um, just to take one example, uh, the Productive Safety Nets program in Ethiopia has a lot of similarities and also funds a lot of work around local environmental public goods. So there is the potential through this to channel finance on really considerable scales um, to local environmental labour to provide um, public goods at the local scale. Um, with a caveat that many of these schemes, and I think Enrega would be included within this, aren't particularly good at tracking either the outputs or the impacts of the local schemes. So the challenge would be we have a system that can provoke, that can stimulate work at a huge scale, and the challenge is to evolve that work um, so that it um, meets some of the criteria that are being discussed here. How could you move from things that are traditionally valued, like a woodlot or a watershed scheme, to possibly more effective approaches to creating resilient and carbon-rich landscapes? Um, and I think there's a research gap there in terms of how to promote that change. It's not a simple task. It's one that requires extensive work, um, probably over you know, decades, with local institutions. But I think there are ways of working around that, and it would be very, very high impact in terms of the um, goals discussed here if it could be achieved. So a couple of final comments. So the research priority really is how to channel 
science and the latest thinking about the best value work of this kind into change at that level. And if you can do that, I would argue it could also have a really powerful effect on the local cultural models that people have for environmental value as well. So this is potentially a really big prize. Um, Yeah, I mean, this sense that you can access the local cultural meanings changing from one set of activities to another, I think, is really the opportunity here. And perhaps just bringing back to um, Natalie's point about changing the relationship between humans and nature, um, these local cultural meanings about environmental value are particularly important. I'll finish, if I've got time, with one quick anecdote. Um, having worked on community forestry in the north of Ghana, there was the phenomenon of the woodlot that never got harvested. People liked the woodlot as a symbol of cohesion, happiness, um, vibrancy in their village, and they didn't want to use it. And so people were always puzzled as to why they didn't take the wood down. So changing that cultural meaning to one where people derive a sense of community and value from a well-managed landscape, that would be the prize. Thank you very much indeed.